Amen. Awesome worship this morning. God is good. We serve an awesome God. I love the Lord this morning. Well, again, I ask myself why. I don't declare to be a preacher, just a servant of God. So just listen to the message. Maybe not so much the messenger, but the word is good and the word is true. Can't go wrong with the word. Amen. Open your Bibles this morning. Mark chapter 11. Pray for our pastor this morning. He's out of town for a few days. He's left me with all of it. Bless his little heart. I'm going to kill him when he gets back. <laughs> when you coming home? Mark chapter 11, verse 15 through 17. We're just going to jump right into the word this morning. So they came to Jerusalem. Then Jesus went into the temple and began to drive out those who bought and sold in the temple. And overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry wares through the temple. Then he taught, saying to them, Is it not written, My house shall be called a house of prayer? A house of what? A house of what? Didn't say a house of praise, did it? Didn't say a house of preaching, did it? Didn't say a house of dancing and shouting, did it? He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. Do we see prayer going on a lot in his house? Do we? A house of prayer for all nations. But you have made it a den of thieves. He said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. The church, I believe, has been so focused on praise and singing and dancing and shouting. Hey, and I'm all for it. I'll be the first one to dance and shout. But I think we've left out the most key ingredient of all, which is prayer. We've forgotten to pray. We've forgotten to pray. Praise edifies us mainly to a degree amen i know god said i inhabit the praises of my people i'm aware aware of that scripture but let me tell you prayer does not replace praise does not replace prayer don't care how much you praise i don't care how much you dance i don't care how much you shout it ain't gonna replace the time that you need to get down on your knees and seek your heavenly father in prayer it's not gonna replace it the church has been called to pray you ask so many people ask well lord what am i called to do what, what, what am I called to do for your kingdom? Let me enlighten you and give you that revelation. You called to pray. Every one of God's children are called to pray. We are called to lay on our faces and intercede on behalf of other people. We are called to pray. That's what we're called to do. And not just with our flesh, but with the, with the Spirit. Through the Spirit. Intercession and groanings. Prayer is what lines up people and situations with God's will. Praise don't do that. Prayer is what lines us up with the will of God for our lives and for the lives of other people that we are interceding for. You know, it's ironic to me that we talk about prayer being taken out of the schoolhouse. Don't look like it's in God's house. It don't look like it's in the church house anymore. We want to whine and complain. Well, our kids can't pray at school no more. Well, do you pray at home with them? Do you pray at God's house? Let's get down where we're really living today, okay? Let's take a look at our lives and see what we're doing for God. Looks like prayer ain't in, the, in God's house, in the church house. 
The church has been so focused on outreach programs and visitation and seeker-friendly ideas, my Lord. Let's get the coffee out front. And the donuts, don't leave them out. Yum, yum. But we have failed to seek God. We have failed to seek God. We're too worried about food and not fasting. That's sacrifice, isn't it? That hurts a little bit, don't it? Nobody likes to push the plate back. We like to eat, don't we? Can't you tell by looking at some of us? We like to eat. We like to indulge. We like to do what makes this flesh feel good, don't we? And prayer ain't fun all the time, is it? Prayer is work. Prayer is sacrifice. Sometimes we just don't want to do it. We're too busy working. And I'm guilty. I'm a worker, but we're not warring. We're not fighting in the spirit realm. We're not pulling down strongholds like we need to be. Where are the intercessors anymore? Where are the people that are called to pray? Where are you at? Y'all won't get quiet on me now. Y'all was all shouting in here a while ago. Now won't you keep on shouting? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So what was Jesus' reaction to a non-praying church? It says he drove out those who were not praying. He cleaned house, didn't he? He drove out those who were not praying. He did what I call purging. Purging. I think we're in need of a good old revival of purging. Not of shouting. Not of dancing. We need a revival of purging. That starts on the inside of a man or a woman. And it gets the junk out of our lives. We need a revival of purging. God send us a purging revival. That's my prayer. Send us a purge and revival. Purge means an abrupt removal of a group of people or of an organization from an organization or a place. It means to cleanse. It means to purify. It means to clear out. And every time I start a study on this and I get to that part, I, you know what I think about? A laxative. <laughs> you talk about clear out and clean out. That's what comes to my mind is a laxative. The church needs a big old laxative. Lord, send us a big old laxative down in the church house and clean it out. That to clean you out good. You'll stay in the closet, all right. The bathroom closet. Hello? That's what I thought about every time I get to that part is a laxative. That'll clean you, clean your system out. But Jesus points out several problems going on in his house in the scripture. Number one, too many distractions. They were carrying wares through the temple. Now, I didn't really get to look up what wares was, but junk they didn't need to have in there because he said don't do it no more. But you know what that tells me? No respect. There ain't no respect in, the, in God's house anymore. We don't respect his house. We in and out of the bathroom 55 times during a service when a message is gi being given out and interpreted. We don't respect. We let our kids run all over God's house. We need to teach them to respect God's house. There ain't no respect for God's leaders anymore either. They talk, people talk to them like they want. Talk to them like a dog. I've heard people on the phone talk to my husband like he's a dog. I wanted to grab that phone and tell him off. I'm telling you right now, 
I'll tell you off in a minute. I won't cuss you, but I'll tell you in a minute. You ain't going to talk to my husband like that. He's a man of God. Plus, less we don't talk to each other like that. It's a bunch of junk. I ain't putting up with the devil's junk. People think Christians ought to lay down and be walked on. I ain't being walked on. I'm sorry to tell you. Now, if it's persecuted for Jesus' name's sake, that's one thing. But just because there's somebody that's got a controlling spirit, demon in their life, I ain't going to deal with it. You ain't going to walk all over me, and you ain't going to walk all over my husband either. I tell you what, it'll get me riled up in a minute. That's why too many people don't say stuff to me here at church. I always kind of wonder why they didn't say stuff to me, but that's what they know. They know. I'll tell them like it is. I'll tell you the truth. I will tell you the truth. And don't get me stirred up now. Whew. But we need to respect God's house, and we need to respect God's leaders, his men and his women. That's one problem, Jesus said. There's too many distractions. There ain't no respect. And there's too many self-centered desires going on in God's house. My agenda, my agenda, my agenda. We don't care about your agenda, your agenda. We want God's agenda, God's agenda, God's agenda going on in the house. It ain't about what I want or you want. What does God want? What does he want? And you notice here, he turns over the tables of the money changers. Trying to make money in God's house. Trying to make money off the, the sacrifices they're selling. What some brazenness, amen? Bold. People bold anymore. They just don't care. But he didn't just tell them what they were doing wrong. He taught them saying, my house is called a house of prayer. And can I say, before the church can effectively pray... It must be thoroughly purged. We got to get cleaned up. We got to get cleaned out. We got to get cleared of all the junk that's on the inside and the baggage that's hanging on to our lives. Clean us up, Jesus. Clear out the junk. Matthew 3 and 12, John the Baptist tells us this in regards to Jesus. His winnowing fork is in his hand. And he will thoroughly clear his threshing floor. You think the Lord God is going to have any junk on his threshing floor? Do you really think he's going to leave a speck, a blemish on his threshing floor? No. We better get cleaned up and we better get purified or we're not going to leave the ground. Your garment must be without spot, wrinkle, blemish, any kind of stain. That's what kind of God we serve. That's what kind of standard he has for his people to live by. Holy, holy, holy. A holy standard he has for us to live by. He said he'll thoroughly clear his threshing floor. I believe God's in a cleaning mood. You ever been there, ladies, when you just get in a cleaning mood? My Lord, you stop from the top, clean the curtains, pull them down, and, and wash them, and clean all the windows, and you got to be in the mood to do that. I think God's in a cleaning mood. Are you ready to be cleaned? Because he gets that wash rag on your head. It might hurt a little bit because he might scrub a little hard on some areas of our life. Amen? I want him to scrub me. I know I got some junk in me that I need to get out. I ain't standing up here telling you I'm perfect. Hello? I know I got some areas. And he, hey, he's working on me. He's working on me just like he's working on you. Amen? Malachi tells us in chapter 3, verses 1 through 3, And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. Even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like launderer's soap. There goes that soap and that wash rag. He will sit as a refiner 
and a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness, an offering in holiness. To refine means to melt, to test, to examine, to try by fire. It's the melting process where impurities are removed from precious metals such as gold or silver. Are you ready for the purging? Are you ready for the purging revival? Hallelujah. We ought to be shouting. Purging is on the way. Can I go ahead and prophesy that to you this morning? Purging's coming. It's coming because he's getting his church ready. Notice verse 1 says, he will suddenly come to his temple. This indicates judgment. Where did the Bible say judgment was going to begin? In the house. In the house. It's going to start in the household of faith, amen. Who will he judge? Adulterers. Those who swear falsely, those who cheat and steal, those who play games with him, those who are shouting on Sunday and living like the devil on Monday, those who are robbing God, those who ain't paying their tithe. Hello. I'm not making up this list. If you look at verses 5 and 8 of that same chapter, it tells you, and I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against adulterers, against perjurers, against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans, and against those who turn away an alien. Goes on to say, will a man rob God? Yet you've robbed me, he said, in tithes and offering. You're cursed with a curse. I said the church needs cleaning. I said the church house needs to be cleaned up. Zechariah 13 and 9 says, I will bring the one-third through the fire. We'll refine them as silver is refined. They will call on my name. In other words, they're going to start praying, amen. And I will answer them. When Jesus starts the refining process, the church is going to start praying again. I guarantee you that because it ain't going to be a fun process. When he starts cleaning house, the, the church is going to start praying. The church is going to start seeking him for help. Help me through this, Lord. Help me overcome this, Lord. I need your help, Lord. Purging the house produces prayer in the house. So how many believe the church is going through a purging today? I think it's starting. I think we're seeing the beginnings of it. God's trying to get the church's attention don't you think Jesus got their attention when he started turning the tables over in the temple? When he started driving them out? What if we did that? Hmm, they ain't tried that yet. That's the thought. What if we started driving them out? All that inclusivity, or have you say that word, inclusivity, that they preach in a lot of these institutions, boy, you'd get, you get bashed, wouldn't you? Because you didn't include everybody. Jesus didn't include everybody. He said, whosoever will, let them come. But they didn't all choose to come, did they? And he chose 12 out to pour into. So come on now. He ain't no discriminator. You ain't going to tell me Jesus is a discriminator. He ain't. Never was and never will be. God wants to see areas of our lives that are not surrendered to him, he wants them surrendered to him. That's what the purging process does. It causes us to see areas that are not in line with his will. He starts cleaning it up. So what's the next step in getting the church house back to praying again? Well, it's a gentle process, ha-ha, uh -huh, called pruning, from purging to pruning. Sounds like fun, don't it? Won't come to the pruning party? We're going to have a pruning party. <laughs> I bet they'll lot show up for that one. What you reckon? Mm, right. Just kidding. We all know pruning is painful. And I 
got some little tools here. If you look at the equipment that's involved in pruning. Here's one. That looks pretty fun, don't it? That's one. Take a good look at it, because you're going to be feeling that before long. Get excited, hallelujah. I'm encouraging this morning, ain't I? Ooh. Glory to God, there's Dudden. If that one wasn't painful enough, <laughs> here you go as a nudden. Ooh, don't let me break this thing, Lord. Ooh. How you like that? Looks pretty fun, don't it? Just by looking at that equipment. Hmm. John 15. Turn in your Bibles. John 15. We're going to look at a good old familiar scripture that nobody loves to read. John 15, 1 through 8, I am the true vine, and my Father the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes, that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word. So once he cleans you up, here we go, boop, 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 to the next step. You're already clean because of the word which I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me, and I in him, bears much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is Cast out. Driven out. Cast out. Driven out. As a branch and is withered. And they, and the Father has thrown them into the fire. Cuts them off and throws them in the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire. There goes prayer, right? There goes prayer, right? You may ask what you desire, and it will be done for you. So here we have two pieces of equipment. He said, you got a choice here. Hmm. Which one? Which one are you going to choose? You can either be cut off. The axe is laid to the root of the tree. Hello. You can either be cut off and cast out, or you can be cut back and be productive. Both of them painful. Both of them going to hurt like a Dickens. It ain't going to be fun either way you go. But which one are you going to choose? It's your choice. It's your choice. Do you want to produce? Or you want to be cast out? Remember the time that Jesus was hungry and he approached the fig tree looking for fruit? Why didn't it have fruit on it? It was alive, wasn't it? It was probably a mature tree, right? Don't you think it was? Had good leaves and stuff on it. Had plenty of leaves and, you know, it looked the part. Sound familiar? There's a lot of people look the part. They look the part. The outside looks all lined up good. Even they can tell you some things out of their mouths that sound good. But the inside, inside ain't good. That's when you need discernment. That's when you need discernment. Hello? This tree looked the part. So why did it have any fruit? If you look at Mark 11, chapter 11, verses 12 and 13. Now the next day, when they had come out from Bethany, he was hungry. Jesus was hungry. And seeing afar off a fig tree having leaves, he went to see if perhaps, perhaps he would find something on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for 
the figs. Did you get that? It was not the season for the figs. That's why I didn't find a f- fruit on it. It was not the season for the figs. I've I read that so many times, and that just never stood out to me like that. It was not the season for the figs. Why would Jesus hope to find fruit on a tree that was not even in season? Why? How could he expect such a thing? Why don't we, we don't like Jesus to expect us things out of us, do we? Same way he expected fruit from that fig tree that wasn't in season. He expects things from our lives as well. You remember what Paul told Timothy? To be instant in season and out of season. In season and out of season. I believe that's where Jesus wants his church. He wants to pr- us to produce fruit even in our off season. Even in our off season, he wants us to produce even when we're weak. Even when we're discouraged. Even when we're lonely. Even when our children ain't living for God. Even when our husbands ain't doing what they're supposed to do. Jesus wants fruit. Jesus wants fruit. He wants some fruit. He's hungry and he wants some fruit off of your life. We got to feed Jesus. The church has got to feed Jesus. We got to produce some fruit in our lives. Got to be purged, and we got to be pruned. We got to be cut, and nobody wants to be, do they? No, we don't. The church wants an easy ride. The church wants an easy ride. It wants an easy way in. There ain't an easy way in. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leads unto life. We got to stay on a straight and narrow walk. This is funny, but talking about fruit, I told a pastor the other morning, I was in the, in the bedroom studying. He was in there in the living room, and I went here. I said, well, I got, a, I got a good old Holy Ghost title for you, a message to preach. Oh, Lord, it's, it's inspired by God. He said, what's that? I said, here's the title. Your fruit ain't worth a toot. (laughs) He has laughed his head off. Your fruit ain't worth a toot. He said, all I know is your fruit ain't worth a toot. (laughs) I had to laugh. It was funny. There you go. A Holy Ghost message right there. Your fruit ain't worth a toot. That's what Jesus is telling us. Your fruit ain't worth a toot. You better start producing something for me. So in other words, our production is not based on our season. It's not based on what season we're walking in, what we're going through, what we're facing, the trials that we're in. That's not what our production should be based off of. It's based on who we are abiding in. Uh, Who are we abiding in? If we stay connected to the vine, we should be producing all the time, every day. Every day, every day, every day. There shouldn't a day go by. We're not producing something for Jesus. Love, joy, peace, kindness, gentleness should be coming out of our lives, oozing out of our lives. But it ain't because we ain't praying. We're not praying. He wants us to stay connected to the vine. Prayer is where we stay connected. Prayer is where we stay connected. My Lord, a praying church is a connected church. Why is the church not praying like we need to? Why is it not weeping between the porch and the altar? We want to come in. We want to shout. We want to dance. We want to have a good time. But we don't want to get down here and weep and cry and travail and wail and call out and seek and knock and knock. 
Am I preaching to anybody besides myself this morning? Whoo, I must say glory to God. That's a good word, Sonia. That is a doggone good word. That is the word of God. That is the word of God for the day. That is the word of God to the church. Woo! Wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up, wake up! That's the word of God to the church. My Lord, help me to pray, Jesus. Help me to pray. The church don't pray no more because it don't believe no more. We don't believe what we ask God to do if we ask him. We don't believe it. If we believed, we'd pray. If we believed, we would pray. Hallelujah. If we believed, we'd see you couldn't keep people out of this altar. If we really believed God was going to answer, well, we'd come up here and pour it out to him. You couldn't keep people back. But we based our opinion of God on our opinion of people. We based it, we, we've got our eyes off of God and we got it on people. People going to fail you. Preachers going to fail you. I'm going to fail you. I'm a human being. But God ain't going to fail you. God will never, ever, ever, ever fail you. Get your eyes off people. You're not praying to people. You're praying to God. You're praying to an almighty, awesome God. A miracle working God. But we feel like because we fail God, we don't think he'll move for us anymore. We base it on our walk. We can't base it on that. If you failed him, get back in, repent. Repent. That's what you do. We feel like we can't pray to God because we ain't been faithful to him. We ain't been faithful to his house. Hello. And we don't feel like he'll be... We should ask him. I, I, should, I don't even deserve to ask God. That's a lie from the devil. That's a lie, a trick, a trap from the enemy. Because God remains faithful even when we don't remain faithful. Hello, that's the word. That is the word. These are lies from the enemy. God has called the church to pray, to pray, to pray. And whatever Satan can do to stop it, he will. We, the church, have got to realize that God has called us to partner with him through prayer. Remember the example Jesus gave us, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth, on earth as it is in heaven. The church must pray for God's will to be manifest in the earth. There's a gap between heaven and earth that the church has got to fill. Let your will be done on earth. But some of us don't see the need to pray. We find ourselves asking this question. If God wants his kingdom to come and his will to be done, why don't he just do it? Why is it necessary for us to ask him? I believe God does not want to do anything outside or apart from the church, number one. This is his body. We are his body. Why would the head do something separate from the body? He's not. We have got to come in agreement with him. But too often the church has the mindset that passively, passively accepts whatever happens. It's just going to happen. Everything will just, just take care of itself, you know. It, it, it'll be okay. Everything's going to work out on, on its own, you know. Lies. Lies. Sounds like faith, don't it? If you listen long enough, it, well, you know, you know you're know, you right. It, it, it'll work out. It, it'll be okay. It'll work out. Yeah. Have you prayed about it? Have you even bothered to pray about it? The church has developed a passive attitude. To be passive means to accept or submit without resistance or objection. The church has got a passive attitude. This attitude says we can never know or understand God's mysterious ways. So we'll just leave it up to him to, to do what he wants. 
He'll do it. He'll, he'll take care of it. He always has. He always will. Yeah, no, no. Just, you know, like up here in the sky somewhere, you know, the people that their brain is like thinking crazy. They just say, whatever will be, will be. You know, I got this saying I say, and I got Mama saying it. <laughs> and the Lord had to correct me on that. I, I say, it is what it is. Ain't nothing I can do about it. It is what it is. And I got Mama saying it. I said, you know, the Lord's correcting me on that. I got to quit saying that. It is what it is. Because it ain't what it is. It ain't what it is. If we pray, it can be changed. The difference can be made if we pray. So my new saying is, it ain't what it is. Okay? It ain't what it is. It's going to be different because of prayer. It's not faith. That's not faith. Because you know what? Doors ain't going to just automatically open, are they? Or doors just going to automatically swing open? I don't think so. They're not just going to automatically fly open for us. Workers don't just miraculously go forth into the harvest without us praying them in. There's something we have to do, people. There's a part we play in this. And I don't think we're doing our part. I just don't think we are. So if all things happen of their own accord, then what is the need to pray? Why bother? If it's just going to be what it is, if it is what it is, why bother? Jesus instructs us to pray. He tells us to pray in his word. It takes more faith to pray than to remain passive. It takes more faith, doesn't it? Amen. So I bet the apostle Peter was glad that the prayer group that was praying for him wasn't passive. What you reckon? If they'd have been, they would have been. Peter might, Peter might still be in jail right now. His ministry could have been cut short. The angel would have never been dispatched, hello. If the prayer group had said, well, God's just going to take care of it. We ain't got to pray about this. That jail cell door would have never swung open, would it? You hear what I'm saying? You hear, you understand what I'm saying this morning. We have to ask in order to receive. We have to seek in order to find. We have to knock in order for the door to open up, hello. That's the word of God. How can we say we're trusting God when we haven't even prayed the first prayer about our circumstance? You ain't trusting God. If you hadn't asked him to move in that situation, you ain't trusting him. You're just trusting it out here to the element somewhere. We have got to ask God. And we all know that it normally requires us to ask more than one time, don't we? How many live there? Got to ask more than one time for the answer to come. We have to be persistent, don't we? I believe persistent prayer is what formed the cloud the size of a man's hand. When Elijah prayed for rain and the earth hasn't seen rain for three and a half years. Take note of the fact that Elijah heard the rain before he saw the rain. He said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. I, I know it's time for the rain to come. He knew it in his spirit, but he had to pray. He had to pray in order for the rain to be released. You got to pray in order for your situation to change. You got to pray. You might feel it in your spirit. Ooh. I feel it in my spirit. You better be prayed about it. You better be brought it to Jesus. Hello? He said, I hear the sound of an abundance of rain. He didn't pray just one time. He sent that servant out seven times. Do you see it yet? Do you see it yet? Do you see it yet? I hear it. I hear it. I hear it. It's on the way. It's on the way. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you see it? Look for it. That's what he's telling that servant. Look for it. Look for it. I'm asking. Look for it. Look for it. It's coming. And then he saw the cloud come up out of the sea. 
the size of a man's hand. And before he could get back and run back to the city, he was being drenched, flooded. That's what prayer do right there. Don't that make you want to pray? Don't that make you just want to pray? It does me. That's what I want it to do. That's, that's the point of this message, to make you want to pray, to make you want to call out to God. Amen? So what if Hezekiah had a passive attitude towards prayer and just accepted the words of the prophet Isaiah when he delivered a death sentence to him? Told him to get his house in order. Get your house in that word keeps coming up, don't it? Get your house in order. What if he just said, well, that's what God said, you know. If he said it, then that's just the way it's going to be, you know. No. Has a guy, he turned his face to the wall, and he began to pray. And he began to remind God, God, I've served you. Lord, you know I've served you, and I've given my life wholly over to you, Lord. Please change your mind. And before Isaiah got out the door good, he said, go back. Mm -hmm. Go back and tell him I've extended his life for 15 years. that make you want to pray, don't it? That'll make you want to pray. You know, it ain't, we get in our mind that we got to have some kind of big old elaborate prayer. Oh, thee, thou God, mighty, holy, Joe, Jehovah God. Just get down there and talk to God like you can. In your countryfied vocabulary, that's what I do. And most of all, let that Holy Ghost flow through you in prayer. Because sometimes we don't know how to pray as we ought. But he maketh intercession for us. That's why it's so important for you to have the Holy Ghost. So you can pray the will of the Father. Amen? You need the Holy Ghost. So I, I know Hezekiah... I'm glad he, he didn't have no passive attitude. And, and that's what I want to move beyond. I want to move beyond the passiveness, the passive attitude, that, that cloak that has come down upon the church today. Because many things are left undone, not because God doesn't want to do them, because we hadn't joined him in prayer. We haven't asked. We haven't sought. We haven't knocked. Prayer is the most vital work of the church. Apart from prayer, nothing happens. Nothing. Nothing happens apart from prayer. That's mind-boggling, isn't it? If we think about how little we're really praying about stuff, how little we're really asking God about things. God is waiting for you, for us, to work together with him so as to enable him to finish his work in the earth. We represent heaven's will on earth. If it's not executed, it's because of our lack of prayer. It is the responsibility of the church to bind and to loose. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. That is our responsibility, people. It also says if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. That's what Jesus said. That's what Jesus says. Sister Tracy, if you want to come to the piano, I'm going to give people an opportunity to participate this morning. Everything's pee this morning. Purge, prune, pray. I'm going to give you the opportunity to participate. A purged church is a productive church. A productive church is a praying church. And a praying church is a prepared church. If we're going to be prepared for the coming of the Lord, we better get back to prayer. We better get on our faces and call out to Him. For the church will become a house of prayer before he returns. You know, the thing is, John the Baptist came forth declaring the Lord. He, he, he declared repentance, didn't he? He said, repent, 
for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent. Repent. And I think sometimes that's a good place for us to start. When we haven't prayed in a while and we had not sought God in a while, all of us need to do it. I'm not declaring, I'm not pointing my fingers at you. I'm saying all of us need to get before God and repent. Because none of us have done everything that we need to do for him. There's some bases we hadn't touched when we ran around the field, right? We missed a few things. And, and sometimes it's not intentional. But we look back and we see where we've made mistakes. And we say, God, forgive me. God, help me. I'm going to do better next time, God. Just show me. Just teach me, God. Have a teachable spirit. Amen. Don't think you know it all. Don't act like you know it all. Don't think you're so spiritual. We need to humble ourselves under the mighty hand of God. We need to keep ourselves humble before Him. So I want you to come this morning. There ain't nobody going to come through and lay hands on you and whatever. I mean, if somebody else feels led to come and pray for you, fine. But I want this to be a time between you and God. I want you to commit. Recommit to prayer, please. Recommit. You don't have to pray here at the church. Pray in your house, wherever you at. Recommit to prayer. Reignite, 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 reignite a fire within your people, God. Let a spirit of prayer come upon us, Lord. Cloak us, cloak us, clothe us, Lord, with prayer and intercession, Lord. Place people upon our hearts, God. Burn our hearts, Lord. Stir us up, stir us up, stir us up to prayer, Lord, like never before, Jesus. Let us get our minds off of our own situations and our own circumstances, God, and get it upon the needs of others, Lord. Let us stand in the gap and make up the heads, Lord. Let us intercede. Flow through us, Holy Spirit. Flow through us. Ula mama. Pray your will through us, Father. Pray your will on earth. Let it be done on earth, O oh God, as it is in heaven, Lord. Manifest, manifest, manifest your presence in our midst, O oh God. Manifest, manifest. Change our desires, God. Let them be let them be your desires again, God. Oh, let us sacrifice. Let us push back the plate, God. Let us fast. Unama and the utetekesha. Lama mama 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 mama. Prepare us, oh God. Prepare us. Prepare us. Prepare your church. Unai.